starts with health, history, health is a human right, global snapshot. She looks at uh, healthcare passingly, though in a marvelous place like Cuba, which reminds me that uh, democracy, alas, uh, has many good virtues to it, but not necessarily uh, the only form of government that can ensure a good health system. She refers very appropriately to uh, the socialization of healthcare in Cuba on page 9. And look at Cuba. James Grant, the great uh, head of UNICEF, who is alas no more with us, Dr. Bindu and I had the privilege of hosting him in Malir in 1981. And for an American to pay this compliment to the Cuban public health system was the best ever. He said, if there is one health superpower in the world today, that is Cuba. And therefore, much as of course we must continue to learn from democracy, I think uh, even dictatorships, one party dictatorships, as has been proved in China, as was proved indeed even in the Soviet Union, which in some respects delivered public health care at low cost or no cost, uh, Pakistan has a great deal to learn. Because we sometimes make the mistake of assuming that simply because we have a democratic government, uh, it will act as a magic wand. So she takes a global snapshot, she looks at the public system, market system, regulation, oversight, financing, employer's contributions, staff absenteeism, pilferage, one of our favorite pastimes, malpractices, uh, primary health care, behavior change, my God, innovations in service delivery, where she looks at how uh, new technologies, whether it's the mobile telephone or an oracular lens that's being offered for just five dollars, uh, where applications of new technologies could help make uh, new service concepts affordable and available on a mass scale with about 10 crore telephones at the moment in the hands of our people out of, 100, out of 16 crore people. Capacity building, cost of medicines, social policy, not looking at social policy just as education policy or health policy, but a comprehensive vision of what social policy means and the reform agenda, finally the cost of medicine. So she virtually hasn't left any aspect untouched, except perhaps the population sector, where she does refer to it. And she also lets us uh, know or reminds us that amongst the many distinctions that we have as a country, one is that we are now the only country in the world which has two separate ministries one for health and one for population. And the results of which, of course, are obvious because we have not been able to integrate these two most relevant processes into a singularity and into a coherence that is so badly required. With one observation on page 49, I simply want to uh, record, first of all, the observation that she's quoted, and this is, Interesting. Under the heading of factors that lead to poor health status and political factors, conflict and disaster, she makes the statement that the recent conflict and extremism in Pakistan has claimed more lives than deaths from maternal and child health and HIV and AIDS combined in one year. Very startling and a very strong statement. I hope it is not true, and this is not to disrespect the credentials and the ability of the author, but when I looked up the references, she attributes this to The Economist. Now, The Economist is a very well reputed paper, a very reliable paper most of the time, but they too are capable of gross error. About two years ago, they gave us the dubious honor of calling Pakistan the most dangerous country on earth. And though some of us may be tempted to share that view, it is certainly not so. 
and unfortunately the economist very rarely gives the bilateral, especially for its overseas correspondence. So we don't know whether this particular statement is actually correct. And I would urge that you should take the economist also with a pinch of salt and pepper and not to take them for granted. And then on the rational use of drugs, she reminds us of something that is shameful. And it is so good that the Director General Health is here today because our approved drug list exceeds 400 drugs, which is the largest, longest list in the eight South Asian countries. And what is the justification? I'm not trying to personalize it and address it to the uh, distinguished Director General. This is a historical process. It was not invented by the current government. But we need to address this uh, undue dependence on an excessive number of drugs which leads to its own complications. And of course the reform agenda which she identifies is most comprehensive and thoughtful. It is a thought through process and it talks about the need for multi-stakeholder consultation, participation, not simply the formulation of a government or a ministry or a cabinet, but something that evolves through participation. Though everything, of course, that evolves through participation is not necessarily good. It can end up with confused, weak initiatives. And when we talk about initiatives, it's interesting she hasn't mentioned this, but in that uh, tracing of the historical process by which health initiatives have emerged in Pakistan, uh, it is apparent that for the first 47 years of Pakistan, from 1947 to 1990, we didn't have a single overarching national health policy. We did have 19 different health initiatives to tackle different diseases and to combat various threats. But not a single time did we have a national health policy. And then of course, because we want to make up for lost time, in the space of 11 years we've had three policies. 1990, then 1996, and then 2001. And perhaps that reflects the other problem, the lack of continuity and consistency in implementation of whatever has been agreed upon in a given policy, which needn't be rigid, but which needs to be, uh, but which needs to be uh, kept in mind as you uh, respond to new situations. <coughs> I'd like to conclude by saying that while the book is a landmark and a milestone, it makes an outstanding contribution to the informational dimension in three respects. Number one. It enhances the level of awareness and knowledge that all of us need to have. Those of us who are interested now have access to an excellent compact source of reference where you would have otherwise needed to go to about 50 different sources to get this kind of distilled data and the meaning of that data in one single source. So it's a valuable contribution on an informational level for civil society. Second, it's an excellent input for discourse within the health sector on a technocratic level. I hope that various health institutions, foremost among them the Aga Khan uh, University, which has done so much to encourage thought and dialogue, uh, uses this as a focal point to stimulate a series of exchanges on where policy should head in the next few years. And thirdly, it acts as a marvelous bridge for the health sector of Pakistan and the global health sector. I know that WHO also serves that purpose. But you just have to look at the uh, back jacket of the book to see the remarkable quotes and the comments that this book has received from outstanding personalities in the global health uh, sector. I think the book stresses the need, obviously, for political leadership and for a holistic view. A holistic view not only from a political level, but to look at uh, the need to integrate 
health with environment, health with education, health with improvement of governance above all. And where we need to remember the different models and systems that we need to learn from uh, to change or to remember what Deng Xiaoping said when he took over the leadership of China from Mao Zedong and he was going to restructure economic communism while retaining political communism, unlike Gorbachev. He said, uh, looking at the free market mechanism and the protests from the traditional uh, socialist or communist cadre within the Communist Party, he said, I don't care whether a cat is white or the cat is black, as long as the cat catches the rat. And that's why I refer back to the human health model, the need for Pakistan to learn from other countries, whether it's Hong Kong, which she has quoted again very relevantly, or Cuba. Let us go out there and learn. I cannot but also help remembering what uh, Ivan Illich, a very profound Austrian philosopher who passed away in the year 2002, had to say about the health system. Of course, his book, uh, Medical Nemesis, he began by saying, the greatest threat to human health is the medical establishment. I mean, no disrespect to the medical establishment. You could say the greatest threat to the people of Pakistan are innocent politicians like myself who are elected or not elected as the case may be. But in this case, one is tempted to turn that around and say the greatest threat uh, to health reform is the health establishment. Because every establishment develops a vested interest in retaining the familiar precepts and principles. And perhaps we should not grudge that. I, as a Pakistani citizen, marvel at the capacity of our rotten, corrupt, inefficient public health system to render enormous service under extremely adverse conditions and do whatever they are doing. Most of us here in this hall today are privileged to be able to afford the best possible health care. Many of us are able to fly out to London, to Mumbai, to Singapore, to New York at 24 hours notice. So we don't know what it's like if you neither have a passport or a visa, you cannot afford an air ticket, and you have to depend on civil hospital or the district hospital in some remote part. And I think we do not often acknowledge the great service rendered by our public health system with all its limitations. It is capable of excellence and it is also capable of insensitivity and inadequacy. But we must take strength from uh, Pakistan's remarkable ability, whether it is to increase the average age expectancy from 49 at the age of 10 when we were born as a country now it's over 62. That's happened in other parts of the world as well. But it's not all bad. And whether it's a private sector that has excelled in showing what uh, health facilities can offer in Pakistan. As my final piece of unwanted advice, may I submit to the distinguished author that in the second edition, it would be so nice to feature even at the risk of being anecdotal, actual case studies of living people, a child, a woman, a man, in a village, in a Kachi Abadi of Karachi or Lahore. Show us their faces. Tell us how our health systems have actually helped cure some disease that they were suffering from. How they've survived. And that will, I think, give the book, uh, a dimension of uh, visualness and a dimension of engagement that even a general reader will be able to uh, easily enter into because this book deserves to be read beyond the health sector. The health sector is far too important to be left to health professionals alone. Thank you for your